imagine a world where you're just a level one digital painter and don't have the money for expensive training. Well, fear no more, because your prayers have just been answered. Every Sunday, free overpaints, Q&A sessions, and exclusive interviews with industry professionals. Vortec Fuchs, Jonas Garo, and Dalek Sobrowski. Level up. Okay, hello, Level Up Session 23 with Levi Petrofi. Um, that was our awesome intro that Jonas made, and I think we all we all like like that intro. I mean, it's so ridiculous, it's so awesome. I just want to, we want to create visuals for that, but let's skip it for now. Uh, so today our awesome guest is Levi. Um, I guess if you are into concept art and if you are into illustration, you probably know him. He's such a big name in the industry. He's worked, he, he worked on uh, really big movies, uh, and uh, I'm really happy to see his uh, work. He, he's going to do a quick walkthrough through his techniques, um, which is awesome. Uh, you can find his work on uh, his uh, website, which I will link in the chat just in a, just in a minute. So, hey man, are you there? I'm there. <laughs> that was a pretty epic intro there. <laughs> <laughs> it was totally improvised. Sorry, I, 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 I'm, I'm is so. Is it coming? Perfect. Is it coming this summer or? Yeah, this summer in all yeah. your local theaters. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Derek is gone because uh, we just started the session one hour one hour earlier, and I think he he didn't catch up. I also didn't like noticed, and I'm just so late and so unprepared. So for, for, sorry for that. We'll try to get Derek as soon as possible. Um, so yeah, mm, Jonas. Yep, I'm yeah. here. Right. So today we're going to talk with Levy. Um, yeah, so like Wojtek said, Levy is a fantastic concept artist. And I actually met Levy for the first time, I think like two months ago or something. Um, it was longer than that, we, but we worked uh, together before in a commercial. Yeah, yeah so we did uh, some work together, but um, only like face-to-face -face two months ago. And Levy doesn't like me saying this, but you know, I've actually been a huge fan of him because he's one of the first artists that got me into concept art even though he doesn't know that, um, because I, I started quite late. And I saw his speed paintings on DeviantArt a couple of years ago, and it just blew my mind. And I was like, yeah, i got to figure out how this dude does it. And if you haven't seen Levy's um, videos, he has actually a lot of videos online that you can find where he shows his technique, but he's going to share it with us again today or something similar. So uh, whenever you're ready, Levy, we can switch to your screen and you can do a demo in Photoshop. Okay. Well, uh, first, thank you, thank you for those kind words. It uh, really means it really means a lot um, that these kind of things uh, happen, and you can kind of pass on inspirations because I used to be. I used to be growing up too, and kind of uh, be inspired myself. And now I'm in the position where uh, a bit more experience, more work experience, and been traveling uh, and working for different clients and you know, studios, and can use that experience to hopefully push people out of the fear of starting in the industry and just be more. Uh, I'm more ready for it, I suppose, and that's why I've been doing some of the live streams and demoings, uh, like FAQs. I did a bit of Reddit uh, thread a week, no, a month ago or so. Mm -hmm. People could ask me any kind of random questions. It was like general about industry or uh, um, schools or uh, painting, uh, some are more or less work related, like the speed painting sketches stuff to more technical stuff relating to production. 
So uh, yeah, thanks for inviting me. It'll be, it's going to be a fun little session. Yeah, I bet. Um, you. Definitely, when Derek joins, then the fun's really going to start. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I just have to call him. Uh, there's so much, uh, so many cool things to talk about, like the Kickstarter that I think has just ended. He's, he's no, no, we still have, hour, right? we have one hour. That's um, so. Yeah, maybe we can do that before we jump into your speed painting. Um, Mm. Uh, just help you promote a little bit because Levy's doing an awesome, on an awesome Kickstarter project, um, and it's funded. But obviously, there's still stretch goals, and there's an hour left. So, mm -hmm. unfortunately, my, if you so, can share my screen, I have it open. Yeah, we cannot uh, share yeah. links in the Google, uh, the YouTube chat, mm -hmm. but I will share it in the in an event. Just yeah, in a minute. yeah. So we'll share it in the event page, so guys, check it out. And if you want to pledge, this book is going to be awesome. Um, it looks really beautiful. And okay. support Levy for his, you know, contributions to the community that he's been doing for the last few years. I stole a lot of his brushes that I now distribute as my own. So. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm just linking. And now everyone knows. Yeah, <laughs> it's okay. I don't mind. Well, let me tell you what. I stole a couple brushes, too. We all did. That's the we beauty. All did. That's the beauty of it. Well, some brushes kind of inspire, and then you kind of develop your own, and you know your tool, brush tool settings a little bit more with time, and then you can construct something that's more useful and more uh, for you. Yeah, exactly. So, so I have a limited set of brushes that I usually usually uh, use uh, for different purposes. Some are like uh, good for sketching, like this this piece I've been sketching while waiting. Uh, just a few tools, really. Some are more efficient in terms of uh, production work that you do, like uh, creating vegetation, trees, bushes, things like that. Something that will speed up your workflow, uh, workflow and process. But anyways... Um, Looks yeah. beautiful. And for the record, Levy did that in like 20 minutes while we were setting up the uh, session, so... So okay, so do you want me to talk a little bit about the Kickstarter or? Yeah, let's 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 go over it quickly. Um, we have Forty-seven minutes left on the campaign. It's initially started as forty day, forty days. Uh, this this um, <clears throat> this project is really a collection of uh, graphic novels. It's not just one one story, and we really want to keep building this kind of. Um, these collections and expanding with more different stories. These two stories are uh, like dark fantasy, very moody, very. Um, if you browse the page, you can get a feel of what what kind of visual language we're we're, we're speaking. There's no. Um, uh, well, as you browse through the page, you you can get a feel for it. So yeah. we have been successfully funded since a few days back. We reached our main goal, which was $20,000, and we have accumulated 25000 which it enabled us to reach our new stretch goal, which is a digital copy of the original script. So it's just as the text as it's written, and which is, usually, is what I get to work with before I even started jumping and doing the, um, the visuals. So that could be like an interest. Oh, thank you, thank you. It could be an interesting thing for 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 readers and viewers to kind of you you read through it and you kind of visualize in your own head what you what it could look like. And then when we're done with the book and we're ready to ship it out, then we can kind of compare these. Yeah, it looks beautiful, man. I'm just um, going through it and sharing it with the viewers so they can see some. Um... Some screenshots. So, guys, we cannot share links in the uh, chat, but if you go to Kickstarter or if you just look for uh, the Dark Tales of the Brothers Harrow, uh, you will find it. And we got 44 minutes to go, so if you would help, Levy. And I was, I would also like to help uh, every single, or uh, like to thank every single backer who has helped us reach this. Without you, this would, uh, this would not, wouldn't be possible for us to create. So. Uh, from from all of us, a big big thank you, uh, and we will 
do our very best to uh, make a really good, good, amazing new project. We, we're hoping that we can create kind of like a new theme or new style within comics, which will be more like cinematic comics or cinematic novels. Yeah, great, man. I'm really looking forward to it. Looks, uh, looks amazing. Mm -hmm. Thank you. There you go. We have 44 minutes left. Yep. <laughs> All right. So let's look a little bit at painting. Mm -hmm. uh, did you have a specific question, or do you? Um, no, I think when people ask, uh, people are sort of talking to each other in the chat mostly now. So if if there's a question that people ask, I will ask them to you. If you're if you're comfortable with painting and talking at the same time, and otherwise, just feel free to uh, do whatever demo you feel like you feel like doing. Um, if you want to talk about okay. this painting a little bit, that's that's fine as well. Um, well, it's a little bit unfair because I started it before we started the session. <laughs> yeah. So. What I would probably do is just redo it completely. So actually let's let's do it straight. Like a blank canvas. So what I've been experimenting, well not not so much experimenting with, is that <clears throat> uh, I created this video some months ago about a Thumbnailing technique, like the thumbnailing, is not really a new thing. Uh, it's, it basically blocks out your whole painting in terms of composition, like color values and everything. But what I've been experimenting with is that when you paint it, you paint it and view it very, very small, um, and that kind of helps you to kind of visualize and feel for the overall piece before you go into details. Mm -hmm. And <clears throat> And it kind of minimizes the work effort too. Like you can notice, as this this canvas here is quite small, the movements I make are not like across the screen like I would do like anything like that. So I'll just keep sketching around here just to see. Now I don't have any kind of subject or motive in mind when I do this. Um, it's just, at this point, random strokes. Uh, now, sometimes there could be a concept in my head or an idea, and then I'll go straight for it, because I know how, to, how I want to depict it or place the objects or shapes. Um. I will just interrupt for a minute. Um, guys, that you're... If you have any questions, please submit them to the chat below the video, and we will try to get them through and answer them. So if you feel like you have a question, please type it in, and we'll manage to, to I don't know, it can be technical, it can be anything. So just go ahead. Yeah, it could be uh, like related to this painting, or it could be production or industry related, like schools or education, it could be... You know, games, cinematics, films, uh, whichever kind of uh, you like, you're curious about. Okay, we already have a question for you, Levy, actually, and okay. that's asking if you could give one advice to your past self, what would it be? To my past self. Yep. That's one of the hardest uh, questions we have. Yeah, <laughs> starting straight away with the deep philosophical ones. Uh, it's actually not that hard. Uh, when and it's and it's really really quite important actually. If if I would go back to the start, I would definitely definitely focus as much as I can on on fundamentals and basics. Uh, because that is the structure of everything you do with digital art and art. Yeah. So really understanding and mastery It might not be the most interesting thing you want to do, you know, when you're an artist who experienced like five, ten years. They already know that. But you say to yourself, like, oh, this is what I want to do, and you jump straight into it without having the, the basic knowledge to kind of 
uh, pull it through, and then you will just be disappointed because you look at the pieces and like, how come it didn't work out? <laughs> mm -hmm. So uh, even even now, as I'm more experienced, uh, several years later, I'm still looking back to the basics because it's it's it's, it's such powerful things you to know and to have with when you work. So anyone who's, who's kind of uh, keen on getting into concept art and keen on getting into uh, like design and conceptual design of characters, vehicles, props, lighting, coloring, uh, this a few years now, it won't hit you straight in the face. But you real, real realize with time that how crucial it is. Um, I think we're having some trouble with the internet connection because I'm hearing you in a very sort of bad robotic kind of voice. I don't know if the people uh, heard everything you just said, but I only heard like 50% of it. No, so there goes your life advice. Now try to decode it and learn from it. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, the advice I would give to myself or repeat again is that to make sure uh, I focus on understanding fundamentals and basics yeah. with art. Yeah, yeah I, f I find the same thing because I sort of rolled into concept art without knowing what it was or actually really knowing of its existence. And I, I never learned fundamentals, and I'm actually only starting to learn them now or in the last year or so. So, yeah, mm -hmm. and I find the same that I, I see that I wasted so many years of producing mediocre work just because I didn't know fundamentals. I mean, you sort of know them, um, how should I say, like on a sort of a sub-level. You think you know them, but then, yeah. Yeah, I mean, you feel then some it, things, you it know. It turns like, out that it's so yeah. much deeper, yeah. Yeah, yeah. You you know them on a non-technical level. You know them like in in terms of like in a sort of intuitive way, but then you're still making mistakes and you're not exactly able to pinpoint why it's not working because you, if you don't know the theory. But everyone feels you know everyone has a feeling for good composition or nice colors. Um, you know you know that because that's why people who master these things have very successful paintings that everyone likes. Um, but knowing that the technical uh, know-how behind it is, is crucial to, be, to master it because you actually you know what you're doing, you know. You're not just throwing paint and hoping that something nice comes out. Uh, and it will actually, like the time you're investing learning this stuff very early on, you will win a lot because then you need to catch up later, you know, as you progress. Mm -hmm. uh, you might be in a different situation, you have less time for it or whatnot, but... Uh, and then once you know it, you you know exactly how to go straight to it, like how to fix the problems instead of kind of, kind of doing it as a guesswork or feeling that it's right. Okay, uh, I have a lot of questions coming in, so sorry if I jump uh, a little bit. Um, let's go with another philosophical one. Um, how much have you had to sacrifice to get where you are now? Uh, there's a lot of, like this is, it depends on what you want to do. Uh, like some some artists are like want to learn really everything, like know a little bit of everything in the production pipeline. Like some people prefer to do specific disciplines, like they you were here and they say like I only want to do character work, or I only want to do environment work. Uh, for, so for me, since uh, I, I, I did bits of work that are related to being a 3D generalist, working with commercials and working with cinematics and feature films. Uh, the more you know, the more knowledge you know, the more control you have over what you're doing, uh, like your shots. Mm -hmm. Because when you're in a studio environment, you realize that you work with people, you hand stuff off to them, you, <clears throat> you kind of depend on each other. But if you can kind of uh, you know, let's say you learn compositing or learn uh, rendering or modeling, you can bypass a lot of these things and you end up having more control over your shot. Like if you have a vision for this shot, 
you can keep most of that as long as you have that knowledge. <clears throat> but it takes time to learn it, and a lot of people are a little bit uh, scared of, of, of learning that much, but I usually try to say, like, learn one thing every day. It could be something you pick up within a minute. It doesn't have to be like you watch tutorials day in and day out. Mm -hmm. Because uh, sometimes the information is so dense that it's hard to digest and remember all of it. But so generally, you're also suggesting that you know having like a broad skill set is is really beneficial. It it it, it is beneficial. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, I agree definitely. I mean, again, it, like it's like you said, like it it, de it depends what what you want to do. And yeah. some people like to, you know, stick to one thing, and then it's fine to be really good at that one thing, and then people will just hire you, you know. Like, some people, like creature designers, are just being hired for that because they're just phenom phenomenal, and they like doing just that. But if you want to do a bit of everything, and you, if you want to have a bit of variety, it's really good to have a, a, a wide skill set. Uh, skill set. Um, and we mentioned this last, last week, the weeks before uh, as well, you know. You know some 3D, you know some 2D, you know some photo bashing, all those things. Yeah, the thing is that if you keep to one discipline, you're not really exercising other parts of your brain when you're solving problems, because you're you're essentially not doing anything new. Like, let's say you're, you're a good character artist, but you're going to stay within a, a limited frame of that kind of discipline, that character art design. You're not yeah. going to go outside and kind of learn about environments, learn about, uh, you know, uh, asset prop functionality or things like that, or rendering, or, you know. Yeah, it's the danger of the comfort zone. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And as soon as you feel, like, comfortable with doing what you're doing, I think it's time to kind of move on and jump on to new things. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I agree, definitely. Okay, some more questions because there's a lot. Um, it, Jonas, just make sure the screen is locked because I, I just seen your face on the stream. It, uh, uh, it's probably because I was talking, but it's uh, on Levy. Don't worry. I've got perfect screen control, man. Okay. All good. Okay, All good. Perfect. Uh, um, people want to know if you were in an educational system or if you are a self-taught artist. Uh, most of the stuff I do, I'm self-taught. Okay. And things you kind of pick up during production, like you kind of study and see what other people do. Mm -hmm. And there's a lot of... Like when you, I think advertisement is a great... Ooh. There he goes again. Because the... Yeah, there's um. I think there's some trouble. Uh, how's it? Is it buggy? Yeah, I think it's your internet connection maybe that's having some some issues. Uh, I'm not sure. Maybe you want to repeat that. Dark is interrupting our session. Uh, okay. Hello. Is it still buggy? No, now it's fine. Now it's fine. Yeah. Yeah. Hello. Hello. It's fine. Okay. Yeah. Good. Good. Yeah. Right. <laughs> Where was I? <laughs> I forgot. <laughs> I actually completely lost track. Uh, maybe we can just move to the next. Uh, it was, you were, you yeah. were talking about the advertising. Um, oh, yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, so advertising is kind of, it's very fast-paced, it's very dynamic, and you have to come up with solutions very quickly, and that kind of triggers your problem-solving problem portions of your brain, like how you kind of solve a certain problem. Uh, and that kind of pressure can lead you to learn new techniques. Like, let's say um, you need to you know, need to render cloths in, uh, for instance. Then, and, and this is this is like you don't know anything about cloths in. You have some knowledge of 3D, but you don't know bits about it. So what the the progress, or what I usually do, is like quickly go on. Uh, uh, <clears throat> yeah. 
quickly go on YouTube and start looking around for video tutorials or other websites that kind of mention this, and then you browse through the video quickly to see what kind of how it's built up, how it works, and then you see like, oh, I get it now, and then you kind of use that to your workflow, and that's another new thing you add to your tool set. Yeah. Like yeah. some people are really worried that, that the, the process of doing something is really, really long. It's not always long. It could be like just a few clicks here and there, and then you're kind of done. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But it could be a bit intimida intimidating. So you are self-taught, but um, like before, um, before that, you, you were working in-house or you were just freelancing. What, how the specific uh, working conditions affected your your uh, so in in uh, in uh, two thousand uh, let's see two thousand six two thousand seven I I uh, uh, went to a two year long uh, program which was more three D than the mapping and two D digital work I do now, but it gave me an insight. <laughs> Hello, guys. There he is. You hey, sorry, sorry for sorry being late. I thought it's a normal time. <laughs> Good job. <laughs> and I just came back from the beach, so. Nice. Oh. You're showing you don't know the time. Well, sorry, guys, sorry. OK, I'm going to mute Derek now, because he's going to interrupt us again. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, no, it's all right. Okay. I'm Everyone's here. So, um, yeah. okay, so jumping yeah, cool. back, um, uh, was that I, I learned a little bit uh, in that school, and that school is was focused on, by the end, lost term to get an internship in the studio. And I got an internship at a uh, small VFX house in Stockholm called Fido Film. Fido Film does a lot of uh, VFX for commercials in Europe and outside, uh, and uh, globally, really, they also do some feature film work. Uh, but anyways, that was my first stop uh, working uh, in a professional environment, and that's when I kind of uh, got in and saw, saw how people uh, worked with each other, what kind of tools they used, uh, and picked up uh, some of that knowledge there. And then I transitioned uh, through some freelancing work to other uh, studios, VFX studios. Um, So, sorry, my flatmate just interrupted me. Uh, <laughs> yeah, so that's that's this this was around two thousand seven, and during the summers I also traveled to the UK to do some more two D digital uh, based uh, conceptual artwork for Real Time UK. Some of their projects they also do some cinematics. Um, and then bit by bit, I got more and more into it and more relaxed with the painting and more interested in learning more of the technical and TV side of it. And uh, when I got to Blizzard, that's where I ended up getting all that knowledge because the cinematics department, or specifically the map painting department, functioned as a studio within a studio. Mm -hmm. So a lot of shots we got was, um, you know, like, color keys or color, uh, color scripts, and it was up to us to kind of solve of how it would uh, come out in the end, like environment-wise and background-wise, things like that. So there was a lot of new knowledge or new uh, softwares we started looking into, what we can do to do it efficiently and quickly and have the work being iteration-friendly. Um, because some, you have to realize that a production is really all about control. You have directors, you have art directors, you have clients. At any moment, they can come in and ask for this and that and change. So it's really, as the more experience you build, the more tools you use, the more control over control you have over your over your skills, um, and you can turn things around very quickly too. So that that is another uh, thing that could be motivating to learn more. Say if you just stay in a 2D realm in Photoshop, then you have to be aware of the limitations of what that gives you. Uh, there are other, other options to exercise quicker efficiencies on how to produce something really quickly. Like if you start thinking as a painter, but also thinking in terms of a, as a production artist and thinking of workflows that are more 
more like exponential. See, like, and you have full control over it. So uh, learning new tools, learning new techniques has always kind of been interesting for me. Um, <clears throat> yeah, can I just elaborate on that with a uh, question from the chat? Um, someone's asking if you think it's worth to combine any traditional techniques with digital within the digital industry, or is it just impractical and a waste of time? Well, I, I wouldn't say all the all the stuff you learn tr traditionally, like I mentioned before, the importance of basics. That is is never going to fade away. That is, if anything's, if you want to stay in the art, digital art or whatever, that's always always needs to be there. That knowledge is super super important. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> I but I think the question was more literally. Like if you would actually, for example, make sketches on, on, on paper and then, um, you know, scan them or something. I, I mean, in my experience, actually, I worked I worked with a guy in film a couple of weeks ago mm -hmm. who's like an animator from Disney, and he's doing, character, he's doing like character designs, and he draws everything on paper just traditionally, and then it's actually colored in digitally, mm -hmm. and those are used as model sheets for the 3D models. Mm -hmm. but the drawings are still 2D, 2D drawings, and... It's actually essential in this part. Like, if you look at uh, 3D animation these days, there's actually the way that the characters are designed are kind of a, should I say, a 3D version of 2D drawing. So they're trying to keep that sort of look from how the character was drawn, but in 3D. And to get that, it's actually really important to draw it first before you start modeling. They don't model it's, it's, it the same way. Yeah, it's just be because it's easier to design pleasing shapes, I think, in 2D, mm -hmm. just with, like, really simple tool, like pen or, or a pencil or anything like that. It's just mu much easier than creating, like, if you are so fluent with 3D, of course you can design in it on a go. But still, uh, 3D programs tend to be very technical, and they can overwhelm you with everything, like panels, numbers, math, everything. Mm -hmm. And then... You can just have a pencil and your design sense, and it can get get you anywhere. And from there, you can go to 3D, like Yana said. You can go to anywhere else. Yeah, the, I think the, 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 the 3D the 3D is just a tool. Uh, yeah. Like you, you, you need to have your your fundamentals there already. You need to have that uh, that skill there already before you jump into any kind of 2D technical stuff. I would say yes and no at the same time because I know a lot of 3D artists that lack certain um, fundamental knowledge when it comes to you know images. For example, the perspective is not something that you really need to worry about if you're mm -hmm. working only 3D because you know wherever you put the camera, it's going to be all right. Well, you, uh, it depends on the discipline, of course, what, yeah. what they're doing. Yeah. Uh, you can't really apply this, this kind of thinking to all of production. Uh, if you're doing something, let's say you're a lighter, then uh, something that would help you is photography, for instance, and working yeah. with light. That's an example. Uh, you just don't s jump straight into lighting uh, on the 3D realm and uh, expect to be a master at it from the start. It doesn't really work that way. Um, that doesn't mean like you have to be like a serious photographer or anything, but you have to have that kind of keen interest in lighting. Mm -hmm. If there's that strong interest in it, then you'll you know, excel and become lead or become really efficient and good at it. Question: Can you tell us about your ex or about the experience working on a big project such as Harry Potter? Uh, it it's it de depends. Um, Hmm. There's there's like certain perks uh, about uh, about each discipline. Like the working in pre-production uh, is is different because then you're kind of providing ideas for a feature film. So whatever survives in the feed, in the final product, it's going to be your idea that you design. However, the people who are actually working in production, uh, like modelers, map painters, and so on, they actually do the final final work, the final pixels that are projected on the frame. Mm -hmm. 
Uh, and it could be, it depends on from project to project how ambitious it is. Ambitious it, it, it is. Uh, like for when we were working on Harry Potter, we did all the exterior Quidditch environment sequences. Yep. Uh, uh, all those uh, hills, mountains. Uh, we also did some uh, fix work for uh, some sets cleanup, which we you all, uh, usually also do in commercials and advertisement. Um, but the pro uh, feature film side is a longer process, more iterations. There, there's more scrutiny on the work you do, uh, even if it's like a 30 frame motion blur shot, there could be like endless iterations sometimes. Uh, it could be, it could be also really, really, uh, like, a, it could, like, you, you work with a big, big team at a certain stage in, in production, and then it kind of narrows it down, narrows down as it uh, ends the, as it closes in to the deadline or to, to the finish of the film. And so you start to see people dropping off, and because they finished the work, there' not much else to do. And so that's kind of what happened to me when uh, I, I got part of the um, Harry Potter, the Hogwarts Princess. I got in around five, four or five months before Christmas on, in 2008, and then worked straight like seven day weeks for quite a while, um, long, seven long days. days. Jesus. Yeah, yeah. Long, long days, uh, which is, you know, crunch mode and all that. Um, but then in the last month, last weeks, then you start to, uh, you, you know, there's less people there, there's less work to do, so everything is getting approved and final and polished and so on. Mm -hmm. But in the beginning, there's like full, full throttle, everyone's there, everyone's kind of running around, solving or working with each other or... Know, whatever problem they have to solve. You were doing Harry Potter through MPC, or? Yeah, that's correct. Yeah, I think in visual effects houses, there's a bit more uh, stress when it comes to finishing up a movie because they have their deadline set from the studio. I mm -hmm. found find that now um, there's a, quite a lot of films going on right now at MPC. Um, they're just wrapping up Maleficent, mm -hmm. and um, yeah, you can just. I mean, in my experience, because I used to work in-house for like two years, it's a lot more stressful, and there's you ha the deadlines a lot, are a lot tighter. I guess because it's post-production and the film needs to be released at a certain date, they yeah. just have to they have to bring it out, they have to release it. But the problem is, there's always someone who's in a higher position who decides to change something. Um, oh yeah, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Basically, the whole team has to you know come up with ideas how they're gonna tackle it because well, they don't care. If you, if they change something like your the deadline's a deadline. Exactly, but this is what I've been talking, what I talked about before: the importance of knowing, really knowing your tools, so you can turn things around very quickly. Yeah, yeah exactly. Because so, it's very easy to waste time, and it's fairly easy if you know how to to save time. You know, um, yeah. people don't care how you do it as long as it looks good. You know, throw a photo in there, throw a three D model in there, do whatever you need to, just get it done. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Um, All right. Uh, so, do you guys want to keep me doing this demo, or like do a color thing? Um, I'm, I'm interested in uh, your work on colors. On colors? If, yeah, okay. if you can show us mm -hmm. that bring the colors into the you know pretty decent thumbnail in black and white. Mm -hmm. Well, my process is usually uh, I never do the whole transition from black and white to colors. I start start straight away with colors. Mm -hmm. When I do the black and white stuff, it's it's, it's because... Uh, but you are starting I, with limited palette or extended there? In the, no, in I, the don't, I, don't, I, don't, I don't start with a limited palette saying, like, I only go, I am only going to use these three colors. Uh, it's... Like, if I have an idea of... Let's see. <coughs> start a new one. So, so it's up to what you have on your mind. If you have the, the ready colors in your mind, you can put it over. Yeah, it depends. If, if I have a vision uh, of what I want to do, uh, then I will go straight for those colors. But mm -hmm. for, 
for this case, let's uh, see. <laughs> Some woman screaming in the background. <laughs> oh, I love these random sounds coming from Poland every week, <laughs> like ambulances and screaming wives. It's Poland, man. It's Poland. <laughs> <laughs> and yeah. dogs with with some you know street disease or something. <laughs> hmm. So uh, uh, okay. So colors. Uh, but when I'm doing this, I'm not really. I'm I'm not too protective about what the colors I pick. Like certain people are very like worried about picking uh, colors that don't work with each other. Mm -hmm. The thing is that it. It always requires a bit of experimentation and kind of uh, playing around before you start to before you start to see what works together. So I would recommend uh, like just simply let go of your piece and just throw in what kind of whatever colors you would like to say. I think this color, so not not the most workable color that there is. Mm -hmm. But that, but when you think like that, it makes you a little bit more more relaxed and open to suggestions as you're doing this. And after a while, when you're working with colors, you you want to aim for the you want to make these colors blend or or work together. You have to find relationships between them because you're thinking in terms of lighting. Light bounces around and kind of interacts and impacts on everything. So even if I pick this strongly saturated uh, pink here, I have to make sure that it somehow works well with the other colors. Now I'm not doing anything that kind of uh, sets the subject for it. I just want to make these colors work together and that's it. And once I have those colors working together, then I can experiment and distort and move things around. Yeah, I feel like it's always easier to start with a wide range of colors and then tone it down as you progress rather than doing the opposite. Um, mm -hmm. A lot of people, when they go from values to color, they, they'll use like, you know, a gradient or something, and you get very limited dead palettes very easily, I think. And yeah, yeah. And look at yeah. the real world, there's so many subtle colors. They're super subtle, and most of it is in the grays, but grays with different hues mm -hmm. that are just not perfectly gray, but it's maybe a purple gray or a green gray or whatever. And I think playing around with that is what really gives you control over really nice palettes and nice colors. Like, it's, and even if you find out that you're working with these colors and it doesn't work, it's not really the end of the world. It's like, okay, it didn't quite work out, then you kind of try something new. Mm -hmm. Are there more questions on the uh, Yeah, there are lots of questions. Um, about, uh, okay, go ahead. There's, there's one really nice one, actually, um, which is more about design. And that's, um, what's the best way to practice your design sense and how to design? You can be a good painter but a terrible designer, so how, how do you work with that? Uh, you really have to understand the, the, the context, the functionality of what it is you're designing. So if you get a brief, make sure you really understand the brief, what it's supposed to do, if it makes sense. Uh, and then you start your first days, your first day just collecting uh, references, collecting videos of how you can portray or convey that, that, that concept that you were briefed on. Uh, you can look at you know, you can, as you walk down the city, you can even study, like, simple uh, functionalities that you see around in your daily life. Like, uh, I don't know, if you pass by a construction site and you see this machine moving in a certain way, why does it move that certain way? And how is it designed to move that way? And so on and so on. Um, then there is like uh, designs and concepts for creatures, like how they're moving, how they're balanced as they move, how are they kind of uh, the whole evolution behind uh, the creature, uh, the environment they are in, like every single thing that comes into concerning uh, uh, to designing these creatures are important, like. Um, 
Yeah, so really it comes down to visual library and studying, I yeah. guess. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's it's got to do with your you have to be like try not to look, but try to observe. There's a big difference. Most people as they live their life, they look. You look through your eyes, you look around, but you don't observe. You're not paying attention yeah. because there's yeah. the vision. Yeah. you have to analyze what you see. Yeah, exactly. So I, I like to like a lot of my visual library building is during while I'm transporting myself because that's like a dead time in your life. <laughs> some people, you know, are on their phones. Some people sketch whatever. I, I really like sitting on a bus and just looking outside and just yeah. looking at the world. And I try to look at small details, you know, things that like a, a good test, like a good psychology psychology uh, test is draw a bike. A lot of people don't know how to draw a bike. Mm. Even people who know how to draw don't actually know exactly how a bike is constructed. There's a triangle shape, the way that, you know, the steering wheel is connected. Like It's like, you, you think you know how a bike looks like, but if you don't look at a bike and just try to draw it, you'll be surprised how wrong you will be <laughs> at drawing it. So you really need to sit still and study stuff and yeah. really absorb yeah, yeah. the shape language, the design language, the functionality of things into your mind. And yeah. that's, that's going to give you a lot of power in creating believable designs. And when you do a really, really good design, it doesn't have to move or function. By just looking at it, it will tell you what it does. Exactly. Uh, you know, why have gorillas these big, big front, front, uh, super strong arms? Well, because they kind of you know, they balance the front body on them. But that's just one example. Mm -hmm. Uh, you tend to work with a really, really small, small canvas, right? You tend to work just really, really zoomed out, right? Uh, it's because you're trying to judge the composition. Without uh, it's more getting... about. It's more about, uh, as I mentioned this before, is about seeing the overall piece and how you kind of work, uh, because you're working with colors and you're working with lighting and lighting impacts everything, the readability of shapes, and uh, you also have composition. But if I would compare, like, let's say I'm working with this, and you kind of see what's going on here. It's still a bit ab abstract, but if I go in and work like this, it doesn't really make sense. You know, mm -hmm. I can't really see the whole piece. I don't really know what's going on. And you can spend a lot of time polishing this area here, making it really, really nice. And then when you zoom, zoom out, it doesn't make any sense in the overall uh, feel of the piece. So that's why even if you can lay down in a crude way like like this is done, you you'll still see it's it's gonna be a recipe for something to build upon later. Uh, I can show you a couple other paintings. Yeah, it's basically this. You can work in this way, but working a reverse way, it just doesn't work. Like like Levy's saying, if you work really big, but you're not you know, thinking about the overall thing, you can zoom out and you'll lose everything and all your details fade and basically everything sort of falls apart. So, let's see. Uh, I actually uh, noticed that when I was looking at some of your uh, your speed paintings on DeviantArt a while ago. Um, yeah. Some of them, like, did, just from the thumbnails, because when you browse someone's uh, gallery, um, wait, like for instance, for instance, if we look at this one here, um, yeah, this, this seems all very, uh, you know, it doesn't really make sense. There's there's a coherent uh, light working in in this scene here because it's all uh, impacting here. There's a certain palette you can read from it, but as soon as I start to zoom out. Yeah, you, you can see, see that the image, what the image actually is. Yeah. And once you say, like, okay, this is good, this is a good stage, then now you can start zooming in, keeping most of the important bits here, the colors, the values, hues, and all that, and just start defining, because defining is more like a straightforward process. Yeah. Um, you know, this helmet here. Yeah, but in the defining process, it's always cool to zoom out it also, because it just can, you know, just be dead in the in the zoom out and it just you know 
you cannot well, see yeah. the details like like they should be placed in the in the right place and no. Like well well I don't mean to say that even if you're detailing you are not allowed to zoom out. Of course you need to constantly yeah, yeah. see that it works together. Yeah. Uh, to make sure that the quality of your element or your painting, the scale ratio, everything works in, in combination with what else is going on here. Mm -hmm. All right. Okay. I don't. What What do you guys uh, think this this scene is? Well, like, it's always interesting to hear people because they all see different things. Yeah, yeah. It becomes, you know, some, something more like open to interpretation and how you develop mm. it. I see, like, first I was seeing a sort of rock landscape, but now I'm actually seeing, like, a street, like a sort of dirty street with a puddle, and then on the right there's maybe, like, a tent or a vehicle wreck or something. I don't know what that big shape on the right is, but mm -hmm. um, I'm, I'm starting to see something more urban than and before I was seeing something more natural. It might be that square shape in the background, which kind of resembles a window, I guess. Mm -hmm. But it's interesting to see that that single square shape sets the scale yeah, of true. what's going on here. If yeah. I would kind of, let's see. For me, it looks like a bit like a lake shore or a seashore with like a boat, that big, like, that big... Uh, yeah, this, this could be the boat, like boat. boat shape here. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, and in the background, we, we have like a house. Right now, you delete the... Uh, the, the square shape, which window. was like a window, yeah. Mm -hmm. It's it's really like looking into the cloud shapes, right? It's it's like everybody sees something different, and it's really awesome because of that. What is what is like right now? You have something that the the colors work together because it makes sense in your mind to read what is going on here. Like you can read like oh, it's a boat. It's it's a reflective water. There's a uh, house here, so the, the palette at, at this stage is really coming together. So what we, what I can do is because I know these colors work together, I can kind of experiment around this and to find a new subject that will keep the palette and keep somewhat of the similar lighting conditions. Uh, uh, your screen share just went off. I don't know if that's intentional, but you can't see your phone it? anymore. Okay. So is just... It back? Is it back? Yeah. Okay. So if I go back to, let's say, we had... Oops. Oh. Actually, let's do it from the beginning. So we had this. We kind of were agreeing that you know these these colors kind of work together. We see a subject, a motif, a boat, some some crude shapes, but it's just a scene, an environment that is lit and it's colored. Mm -hmm. So we know the relationships uh, work now, and if, once you establish your lighting relationships, your colors, you have some kind of balance light thing that is going on here. You can use this to kind of re, uh, reconstruct your image to portray like a new uh, subject. Uh, what you're uh, let's see, I can. So here we go. So when you are sketching like that, do you have a specific idea in mind when you are starting now, or, or is it just uh... what I usually do these sessions? Is that let's say I found this this subject, and although it's somewhat interesting, I'm not really completely interested or, or sold at sold by it. So I, I'll just keep experimenting, but keeping some of the palette mm -hmm. to see if I can come up with a. Uh, more interesting subject to portray. Okay. So. so someone's asking, how how do you come out with this technique? Like, when do you know it? When do you know that you've sort of nailed what you want to have? Is it just when you have like an interesting, 
shape and value composition in your in your thumbnail? Well, when I decide on something. Yeah, like when when would you say like okay enough experimenting this is what I'm gonna stick with like. Uh, I mean, there's no time and pressure. It's not a contest or anything. To you know, like, okay, I have five minutes left to find something. It's it's not really like that. You um, sometimes I I feel like I'll keep going for hours and hours just to see what happens. Right, but uh, I mean, like, is there a trigger something that can trigger like, ah, oh, wow, okay, this is what I want to keep working on. Is there some sort of trigger that you know tells yeah. you that the image, yeah. Um, sometimes it is. Sometimes you see a really cool shape that you want to work with and then you stick with that. Uh, it could be something that speaks to your, you in a narrative way. It could be like a... Like for instance this now, it looks like a... We kept the colors here, but this looks like a completely different uh, nature, scene, or environment. Mm -hmm. Yeah, just before for one second I saw like a character when you had moved a bit more up. I saw like a dynamic composition with the character standing yeah, yeah, in front yeah, yeah. of you. Like it's it's really interesting to see how your eyes can it's like the <laughs> text says, it's just like laying in the grass and looking at the clouds. Yeah, the thing is that there's a combination of soft transition, like soft uh, strokes, uh, and then there's also hard edged areas you work with when you're distorting something. Mm -hmm. And you know, this looks like, I don't know, a beach with two rocks here or something like that. Let's see if I can find something more interesting. And it's quite, it's quite relaxing to do this thing, uh, to do this approach. First off, you're, you're, when you're doing a thumbnail version like this, you're... Uh, it's easy. It's easier to work with than something you spend days and days in detailing, and then you're afraid of changing things uh, on it because you spend so much time on the on the work already. So I'm not really very protective about uh, what comes out here. If it's a subject I really like, then I'll I'll keep it. But if not, then I want to quickly change the subject uh, for a minute because um, we have been talking about the workshop that I'm in this summer and Levy is actually um, the guy who's organizing it or one of the guys who's organizing it mm -hmm. and am I right when I say that the new tickets go on sale in one minute? Uh, that's correct, yes, yes, yes. Yeah. So uh, if um, <clears throat> there is... The let's see. Yeah, so six PM the tickets the ticket purchase page will go go live. Uh, we have a newsletter where people signed up where we kinda where we send a link. Um, I can show you right now for those who are interested. If you can show it on your screen, that would be great because people are looking at, at your screen. Yeah. Hold on just a second. I'll get it. <clears throat> uh, while you're looking, I will just show because I think some people in the chat are confused with your technique because they're not really seeing what what it is exactly, and I, I'm going to show some of your work in the meantime um, that has been done with a very similar technique. Uh, so if you go to Levy's DeviantArt page, and you will find, um, I know from some of your old, because I've seen the videos of it, um, where you basically construct from these kind of sort of bashings, you know. Um, I'm gonna look. There was one that you did from a horse that you turned into a woman. I'm looking for it now. Man, you have so much work. Insane. <laughs> yeah, it's just ridiculous. I'm pretty sure this is started from a from a bashing. 
um, you can see it, it, it basically comes out to you know to blocking out big shapes and then slowly slowly working it into something that we that we can understand. Yeah. Oh, oh yeah. Is... Here's an interesting one. So here you can see, for example, on the top left, how um how it's just <laughs> what Levy has right now, just random colors bashed, and then slowly building it up to the image on the right, which which looks amazing. And if if you zoom out, um, you know, it has a very photographic feel to it, even though it comes from absolutely nothing. You know, it comes from a Pollock painting. Okay. Here's another interesting one. <laughs> you you at the beach turned into a fat lady with a child. <laughs> Crazy man. Right. Okay. okay so, so the just a second. Can you screen share? Because Sorry? your screen share is off. Your screen share is off. Yes. Okay. So the per oh, oh wow. You, if you want tickets, guys, it's time to get there because people are purchasing right now within seconds. Uh, <laughs> let me share screens. Share screens. It's up on our web page. Um, You're still not screen sharing, by the way. I know. I am. I am about to. Okay. 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 Can you see? Yep. Can you see the workshop website? Nope. We can see for shop. Oh, for you have to share the whole screen to get the browser to be visible. Uh, I yeah, will share so when the, you... the link to the event page as well. <clears throat> when you click on screen share, you get a lot of options. And just pick the full screen one that's going to show everything that's on your primary monitor. Mm -hmm. mm. Is it working now? Yep. Okay, cool. So, yeah, um, this workshop is going to take place during August, late August, 29 to 31. We have uh, 12 instructors, all leading professional artists from this, uh, working on different areas, games, commercials, film, feature films. <clears throat> They're all going to have uh, very educational lectures for the attendees. Uh, we're going to be based in Hoxton in London. Um, it's a really nice uh, area with great food, great coffees. and It's called the Silicon Roundabout. There's a lot of people with uh, innovating people, entrepreneurs. Uh, so there's, uh, it's a great location to be uh, having this workshop at. Um, so if you browse our website, you can see all this content. Uh, it has information about the payments of tickets. It has a map. It has uh, image gallery for all the instructors' works. Uh, we have a blog that we'll update uh, as we go, addressing different issues, travel, locations, um, some artist galleries. No, some individual artist works that we promote. Um, so yeah, we have, we are selling 50 tickets today in total. So make sure uh, if you're really keen on attending, uh, sign up for the for the for the tickets. And if we go, if I go directly to it, yeah, there's the page. Uh, Standard tickets have gone live, so once all the all the fifty are in the system, this uh, this page will be looking like this. Once uh, they're 
uh, all in the process, they were, the system is going to lock down until the payments has, have gone through. So we'll do another batch within uh, a few weeks to sell the rest, remaining tickets. Um, but it's going to be a really fun event. Everyone is looking forward to it. We met all the instructors. Everyone is inspired and motivated to do something really unique. And I think it's about time London uh, has an reg uh, uh, annual regular workshop that uh, not just addresses 2D and digital art and traditional art, but also more uh, disciplines within production, say compositing, modeling, uh, cinematography. We can, we've discussed the idea of doing single night sessions to events. Um, like panel discussions where people can meet uh, artist professionals, uh, hang out with recruiters, and so on and so on. So yeah, yeah there's I'm not excited. so much happening in terms of workshops um, in Europe in yeah. general. So yeah. I'm really excited yeah, yeah. to see another project coming through, and I bet it will be like a huge success. Uh, so it's based in London, right? Uh, we did it. Uh, Place it so yeah, it's in London. Yeah, it's in London. Yes, yes. Yeah, and by the way, in case you didn't know, it's in London. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, these are about a, these are photos from the uh, from the uh, space, the venue. Jonas, you've been there. You've seen it. Yeah, it's nice. It's, uh, I like it. It's a nice area as well. Yeah. Um, it's quite cozy. It's not too big. There's a amazing um, like crafts coffee shop like right next to the venue, and mm -hmm. yeah, the food, the food and stuff is gonna be really good as well. <laughs> I know this is not really the main selling point, but I I like food, so you know. Well, you me. know, it's <laughs> it's a nice surprise for the people who attend. Like you know, you sit all day and listening to the lectures and. You're getting hungry or thirsty, you know. There's, we have we we'll provide some of that for you. Uh, not many workshops do that. Uh, we just want to make a really nice experience so we can build a strong audience to do bigger and bigger venues in the future. Like let's say we want to do several hundred one day or bigger venues uh, with more more lecturers, more content, and so on and so on. Finding bigger sponsors. Um, someone's asking in regards to workshop if it's worth bringing laptop and tablet with with them to make notes or try techniques. It's it's all up to it's all up to you really. It's not we're not going to give you like assignments to do what we're going. Uh, it's going to be um, very focused on educational value. Like all of all of us instructors are going to look back to our own experiences and kind of. Not summarize, but pick out the mo impo most important bits to um, to what helped us and evolve and develop and within our field. So it's not going to be like, oh, here's a school assignment; you need to draw ahead, kind of thing. Uh, but definitely bring something to take notes, or you know, a laptop, iPad, iPhone, or phones. Uh, it's up to you. No cams on torrent websites, though. I'll be watching. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and I believe uh, you guys will attend somehow, that the level up will be there. Oh, that's a secret, man. We haven't actually shared anything about that yet. <laughs> but yeah, we have, we're have. we talking about some plans to include level up um, into the workshop. And we might even stream a bit of the workshop on one of the sessions because those two, it's a three-day workshop, but you know, level ups every Sunday. So, and I will be on the workshop. So, you know, we'll we'll see. We'll announce more about that later. That's okay. Perfect. Cool. Yeah. Cool. So, um, <laughs> Sorry about that. Uh, no, no, no. It's perfect. <laughs> like, um, I just want to talk about one thing. If you were, we are just started talking about level up. For, for a second. Uh, Jonas, can you share to my screen? Yep. Can you share my screen? Already happening. All right, so we have launched the page during the past week. And if you don't know it already, uh, 
the address is fullstraw.com. So basically, it's our names compiled into that awesome code. Um, so yeah, on the page, you can find uh, the section where, where you can find all the previews and upcoming sessions, like one upcoming. And rest is uh, past sessions uh, with like the Wojtek, Wojtek. I yeah. cannot see your screen. I'm just seeing uh, your beautiful Wait. face. Oh, oh, it should be there right now. I can see is your screen. Is it working? Yeah. Okay, it works fine. I can see yeah. it on YouTube. Yeah. So uh, you have all the sessions in here. You can download the PSD files from the session, and you will download all of the overpaints and all of the. Um, Yes, demos. Uh, you have a can go back to the Facebook event as well. Uh, so there's over uh, I think 60 hours of content right now that we have created with our awesome guests uh, and with Dark and Jonas. Um, so there's plenty, plenty of things to watch. Then you have an overpaint overpainting gallery with all the overpaints. Maybe not all of them, but like most of them. Most of and if you will go. Yeah, if, if you will go to the specific overpaint, you can download the PS, that single PSD file for it. So you can check it out and uh, break it down uh, in your own um, Photoshop. Then there is that section which is called resources. And here we wanted to really include all of the useful links and um, resources that we have used. What is that? <laughs> so I'm just like... applauding you for the resources, man. Yeah, but it was so much work. Like, this is like months, really. Like, yeah. Months with like our, our uh, workflow, but still, um, check it out. I think it's really cool. Like, I, I even go, go back here to just, you know, go to like not painting resources or checking out different books and stuff because it's all three of us compiled as well as like guests uh, links and stuff compiled into one list which is awesome and then there's that community link which links you to the Facebook page where you can upload the overpaints and such if you have any suggestions regarding the site please let us know uh, you can PM us or you can just go and send us an email uh, we will try to update it um, every week um, so that it stays updated with uh, latest overpaints, latest session, and uh, we will add resources um, mm. if there will be any new in the session. Yeah, so that's all. Uh, Fustrada.com. Check it yep. out. And yeah. so, yeah, again, this session we'll be asking Levy for some books and stuff, and every time a guest suggests us something, we're going to add it to the resources. Yeah, so, and in case you haven't so seen it, uh, the, the resources will also show you if things are free or paid, because we're linking to some paid websites, but we're also linking a lot of free stuff. And you'll be able to see if it's free or paid, or both, because some websites have like a free you know, plan and a paid plan. Um, so yeah, you can just quickly see if you don't want to spend any money, just follow all the free links. Yeah, there we go. Cool, cool uh, work. All right, so if any of you guys done an overpaint, I'm working on one. So maybe ten minutes more, and I will be done with it, so I can talk a bit. Okay, I'm I'm done with mine, so. You can, you can okay. switch to my screen. Yeah. Um, so this is the work of uh, Jan Metzel. Metzel. Um, it's an environment piece in which you can find like this really strange construction and like coast and uh, it's like a it's like a coastline with a small harbor. Um, so yeah, there's a lot of uh, issues. Not really. Like we can argue about values, but still they're m mostly working. But there's tons of the de design issues in here. Like um, I have no idea what's happening in here. Like I, I know what the author was going for, but I, I just cannot. Like maybe the whole idea is cool, like having the city on, on that kind of a pillars and stuff like that. But 
they are not working in terms of design. And actually, I have lost the idea of, of that kind of stuff in my overpin because I just couldn't figure it out in like 15 minutes. Uh, I think I would go and build like 3D uh, base mesh and like overpaint over it and uh, some or do some photo bashing over it. So I just tried to remain this main structure in here and build everything from 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 scratch and try to uh, try to change like uh, the statues which are there. Like you can see, these are like statues and stuff like that. But I can easily see where the Jan referenced the photo and where he was working on his own. So we, we can see a huge huge gap between. The, the design and the texture, which is which is not good. You have to get your design sensibility, and we have talked about it to just another level. You have to know what looks cool, and uh, you have to know what are you going for in your piece. If I'm going for an epic look, if I'm going for a mysterious look, if I'm going for a certain mood, then you have your tools, you have your mind to envision it. You can tell, okay, so these colors look like that in in this case, and they're connected with these emotions and such. So what I did, I was just laying photos over, trying to get some mood on, and I tried to remain all the elements in there. I changed the values and stuff because I built this from scratch, but I tried to remain the, the same like idea that we have like a castle uh, or something in here, which is it doesn't look destroyed. It looks like it. It has these really strange, um, bizarre um, pillars and, and stuff like that. And if you have such an couple, and what I have on Leaf Cloud is like really simple shape for that. Uh, if you have su such a like complex idea for the construction, and uh, as you can see, you have used the photos for for the background. You probably are going for some matte paint finish or something like that, uh, as I cannot see painting over photos. So maybe you want to use 3D for building such a complex structure. Um, like you can paint a lot first and try to match the photos, and then you can implement 3D into your scene just to back up your um, your perspective knowledge and, and stuff like that. Um, yeah, so. That's it for me, um, I think. So there, there was just a, a lot of design issues in there. And um, I yeah, think there were a, with, yeah. a lot of scale issues. Yeah, yeah, that's, that's, yeah, exactly. That's also what I wanted to talk about. Like, um, There's tons of, like, you can see the size of windows here, here and then, like, uh, the size of the ship, it just doesn't match that the windows are too big in here compared to, it looks like uh, it just it just hits you in a, it's your work. It, it, you're just backstabbing yourself with that kind of stuff because you want to create a really big structure. So you want to get in and paint really small windows or, or don't paint them at all so it looks like really Big, big structure. You can also see windows in here, which I bet you wouldn't be able to see from this distance at all, or it would be just the tiny, tiny dots. Uh, so yeah, as, as Sienna said, there's there's a lot of scale issues that I also wanted uh, to address in here. So basically, I, I had this uh, castle plate in here, but actually I have del deleted all the the shapes for. I have the shapes of the bricks, which which is. The, which is not matching the, the scale in here, so I have a lot, a lot of scale issues in here as well. Uh, but yeah, that was just a fast overpaint to to showcase a couple of ideas where could you go with 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 it. So yeah, that's all. Yeah. So something that you think about when it comes to scale is just that as humans, we have we have a set idea of how big something is um, about certain objects or shapes. And then there's a lot of things that are arbitrary that can be any scale. And it's very important to know that if you introduce a certain element to your image, you are going to introduce a certain scale to your, to your image. And like you can see in the previous one, because of those large windows, 
suddenly those boats look like miniatures. Um, so we know how big trees are, we know how big windows are. We know how, and obviously these windows could be very large. Maybe they're very big windows. But why doesn't it work? It doesn't work because our brain is telling us that the relation between the relations between these objects are so. And and you can feel it. That it's a matter of scale things up until it's to, to fix these mistakes. Yeah, oh, you're totally right. Uh, Derek? Yeah, give me two minutes more. <laughs> uh, maybe, maybe we can look at you while you're doing it. Okay. Yeah. I haven't seen you paint in a long time. Yeah. And people are going to start thinking that you just copy-paste your horses from every painting into the next Yeah, one. yeah, yeah. <laughs> I wouldn't do it. No. <laughs> I know. At a time. I love too much horses, so... <laughs> okay. Uh, so, um, uh, this is the study painting I found on Little Lab Group. And so far, I don't know the name of the artist. Shame on me. But... <clears throat> Uh, I think the proportions and overall pose is. Uh, I have the the reference that he had uh, in the back to back to it, and I think the the overall overall proportions and stuff is set very cool. But what I don't like about it is just too saturated uh, values and the the most deep deep in part in the shadows that are very dark, like a you know pure black. And there is too much, uh, just too much difference between the very shadow and very enlightened part uh, on the picture. So the values is a bit, values are a bit off. And I wanted to make it more like a, you know, like a whole structure of the body, and the, the body would feel better in, if the the values were set a bit more, you know, more balanced and more deliberately. So I made. Uh, my version, and I'm still working on it. And <clears throat> I think the most important is the most important thing about it is just make more mid tones, uh, not to, to exaggerate with highlights and very deep uh, shadows. As you can see, my version is much more subtle, and the only parts there are on there are you know pure black like shadows. There are only her and very, very uh, dark, you know, parts where the light is not going on, like, you know, like on the, on the leg, it will be, <clears throat> so I can darken it a bit. And what I also notice about it, it's too much uh, sharp strokes of the pure brush without any soft edges and soft uh, transitions of the shadow and the light. If you make a bit more soft, if you make it a bit more softy, it looks immediately much more natural, and the body would have, you know, the feeling it's like like a normal body, not like you know, like a drone or, you know, with the the thing like he outlined overall the pose and make it a bit flatty, and yeah, I think uh, the most important part is just to, to make a right division in the values and put more uh, more deliberate strokes without uh, dis disturbing lines, and uh, the, the most dark parts shouldn't be very, very black, so just don't, uh, no, you cannot rely wholly on the photo because photo can can make a, you know can make you um, feel it's not it's not all right if you don't have the enough experience about it and you you don't observe enough uh, you can put the very dark shadows into the in, into the values and the values are off uh, even if they are the same like on the photos so the more observing and more and and more analyzing the photo, so you are more able to to notice the difference between the regular thing which is going in the nature and the reference, which can be just the base of the picture, not like 
you know, copy paste as you said. So, yeah. Um, I can also see you are getting rid of the line work, which is also making it much more uh, realistic in terms of like com compared to the reference. I, I don't know it if it was intentional from the uh, from the guy that was studying it, but yeah, I, I was thinking about the same, and I think even if it was, uh, you know, intentional, I think the values uh, shouldn't be very rough, like it like it is without any soft transition on the on the skin tones, because it's quietly destroy you know the feeling of the body and that uh, you know you cannot reach the the regular values on it without the soft transition, so. But using the soft brushes can be tricky also. So it has to be done very, you know, quickly. Not quickly, but subtle and very del deliberately, I think. Yeah, it's because the testing a volume change. And the body were you know, body is very recognizable. So if you get a wrong volume, you're suggesting a shape form that isn't maybe it's uh, your connection is so glitchy, man. Yeah, something's wrong. Oh. I am. Hello. Hello. How uh, Better? No. N not that much. <laughs> like a robot on us. <laughs> R2, 2D2. <laughs> Perfect. Google Hangout. Oh man, you there? Yeah, I'm here. Okay. Oh. Hello. 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 It's terrible. Something is happening. Yeah. It's Paul. No, it's London, man. <laughs> I <No> have way. <laughs> So is, uh, I don't know, Wojtek, is my, the screen on mine? Yeah, yeah, the screen is so on yours. So. so just it's about the cleaning up right now, the values, with just a soft uh, soft brush. And if you want to put some more hard edges, you can make a selection with uh, with the lasso or make a bit, uh, put the hardness of your, of your brush a bit more. But now I can have it like in 15 percentages and make a very smooth transitions with even without any smooch tool and uh, make it more like a whole body without any you know distractions with line work and the stuff um, Levy there is a question to you um, if there is any place you store your art that is older than 2007 because I noticed that your different yes. artworks are no older than 2007 and if you could get a glimpse of the art that is a little bit older, it would be awesome. Oh yeah, I could uh, <laughs> definitely show some of the old, old stuff to, to, to motivate people. Uh, just give me a minute. Let's see it. I will share your screen. So. Are you sharing my screen? Yep. But it's on your webcam right now. Alright. Just a second. This is a uh, work that I started to do uh, as soon as I got my first Wacom, which was around 2001. Oh, that's so, that's like 14 years. Yeah. 15. Do, do you see it? Yeah. I thought you were going to take us to your MySpace. <laughs> no, no, no. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, I prefer not to click on any of these for high res, but all right. Let's Dude, go that down. looks so much better than anything I did in that. Uh, oh man. These initially started as scanned drawings, and uh, I like the smudge, smudge tool and lots of soft light and glow. Uh, 
Uh, but I was just sitting uh, in a cafe or at home drawing some of these figures. How how did you find out about digital painting so early? Because, I mean, Photoshop is not that old, and digital painting in general, 2001, there was nothing about digital painting. How did you actually even figure out that you could draw with a computer? Uh, I think I had a friend who um, uh, who may have had a Wacom at school. Uh, he used it to do his comics. Um, then I thought, like, oh, that'd be cool investment to uh, because we had a scanner at home, and I wanted to scan my drawings to have it in digital format. And then thinking about coloring the drawings. I didn't have any kind of long-term intention with any of these. It was more, more like there's a couple of cool drawings you probably people can give a console and if they like it. So that's all uh, what I what I did back then. There, there was like um, I think this in, this was back in Sweden too. One of the first major big big uh, online galleries where people could post their works. What's it called? It's called Elfwood. <laughs> okay, that's the name of the website. Yeah, okay, Elfwood.com. We <laughs> yeah, it's really interesting because I can really feel your hmm, like that these works are actually yours. I mean, I probably wouldn't be able to recognize them if I wouldn't know your recent artwork, but still, if I know your art right now, right, and I'm seeing these, and I can see the connection between them somehow, there's some, like, maybe not this piece, but the pieces behind, like, the dust matter, and, like, the, 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 the reds, and the, the, you know, kind of stuff. It's uh, really, uh, that, that's really interesting that somehow you can find, a, 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 between, between that really huge gap, there's really, like, between these years, there is that really thin connection that stayed, like a, some kind of a taste for something that was just developed over time, and you can see that it's just a growth, and that's really Yeah, no, I think that's, that's definitely a good point. I mean, I think that your taste is actually largely defined when you're pretty young, and things that you see as a kid really influence you a lot, and... I don't, I don't. I mean, obviously, it does evolve over time, but there are certain things that you love and that you like that will probably be there for the rest of your life, because you know, it's just a part of your taste, like you said. Well, it's oh, oh, good stuff, man. What's that? <laughs> well, it's I, good stuff. I'm enjoying seeing. Well, I, I don't mind showing this stuff because um, when people come, oh, it's, it's great. Like, oh, it's great. Fun. This dude sucks. Actually, I have uh, an idea. Yeah, Jonas, for doing like the whole session devoted just to looking at our our like really beginner stuff, you know, to show people how we have all yeah. started from from where we we are going, like like, like one of our past Jihang. Yeah, yeah, we are we were showing our like first work, and we we had so <laughs> much to laugh. Like, it was so <laughs> hilarious. We have to do it live. Definitely, it's so much fun to to show like all these creepy yeah. attempts to to be awesome. Like that's just hilarious. We have to do it. I, no I pain, no gain. <laughs> no pain, no gain. Yeah, that's true. Once. Even what? I think we showed a couple of old ones in like session twelve or something. I'm not. I'm not sure, but yeah, maybe we can. Yeah, we can devote a session to looking at old works, and maybe we can actually do repaints of our old works to show how yeah. we would now improve it. Just overpaint our own crappy old works. That would that would be pretty cool. Yeah. So you are going uh, with uh, another take on the on the color palette you had, right? Uh, with this one. Yeah, is it the same color palette you had? Well, like with the yeah, it's yeah, yeah, it's, yeah, it's, yeah, it's pretty much the same. Distorted. Yeah, and with 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 Photoshop, you can e easily uh, change or shift colors around to make it, you know, more warmer, colder. 
what you established in the first sketch is the relationship between colors that work. Um, so there's no need so to, to change the this, Yeah, just shifting overall will impact the overall image, so the relationship should still uh, maintain or be kept. Okay, okay, I understand, yeah. So, for instance, we, get fr we went from a colder one to a little bit more, you know, but they both kind of work because the relationships between the, the color and light, they work. You see? Yeah. So basically you're like shifting the hues globally and just getting different. Yeah, and as you, as, you, as you keep going, you can isolate certain areas uh, and, and change the colors there uh, to go more into fine-tuned color changes. Uh, for instance, just doing a little bit of bounce light right there. So I'm just refreshing your Kickstarter Kickstarter project, and it's funded. It's your seconds to go. It was funded like 30 minutes ago, right? 40 minutes ago. It has like 350 backers, which is awesome, and almost like 6,000 over the stretch goal. Oh, so nice. Big, big congrats to the to the whole team and. Thank you. Uh, Thank it's you. really really appealing. Looks uh. Looks really awesome. Like I like this really dark, sort of moody feeling to all of the works that are showcased. Well, that's that's kind of what we're aiming for. It's a dark, dark world we're depicting, um, but with a touch of you know, or a lot of focus on cinematic lighting and kind of movie screen cap feel to the panels. Um, yeah, that's yeah. what I thought. It looks like. Frames from movies, like just, just like it will, yeah. it, it will, it will keep the, uh, the 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 sequential art, which is basically comics and how you kind of construct pages to establish environments, characters, <coughs> story, uh, narrative, and pacing, and, and, and during through the pages. Uh, so we'll keep all of that kind of. Uh, all those tools, but the only thing we're going to do is establish this style, which is more cinematic uh, looking. Um, I have that thing that whenever I, I took like a comic book that looked appealing to me because of the, the cover uh, illustration, when I opened it, like the level of art suddenly dropped. Of course, I'm not talking <laughs> about people like Mobius or, or, or people like, you know, uh, like that. I'm just talking about regular kind of comics that has like really cool covers, but then when you are opening it, there's like it's all different. It's all different. And with this project, I can see you want to maintain in that level of, of, of I, I don't know, this is just another level of, of uh, visual storytelling, I think. This is, I haven't seen anything like that before, um, that every shot is so refined and so uh, well lit, and uh, I mean, from what I can see in here, right, it looks like a frame from the movie, and I'm not trying to get it on the level of a movie because I know it's something different. And yeah, it's perfect. I, I, I love it. Thank you. Just love Thank you. It. Well, that's kind of the, the big challenge with this thing. It's not uh, like we, we did, we created a uh, breakdown, more like a panel dialogue uh, talking about one of the panels and how we kind of construct these. And that there is a lot of subconscious uh, narrative cues to be explored by the reader and the viewer, outside of just reading the caption boxes and uh, the talk bubbles. Like it's it's very intentional in terms of narrative uh, storytelling, because when you just look at an image, it, it, it tells you what kind of context it is in, how the people feel about each other, if it's two people or more, if there's an action going on, if there's uh, certain type of emotion that we want to depict, we try to do it also visually uh, instead of just just having text explain it for you. So we're putting a lot of uh, uh, a lot of things into this comic, uh, making it making sure it looks uh, nice and cinematic uh, to have you feel that it's gonna, you, you're reading a movie in a way, uh, but you'll still have lots of important sequential art and narrative cues in it. 
So hopefully, like as the as the viewer goes through it, they explore more and more and understand how we design each panel. Perfect. Will there be any way to uh, buy a book besides the Kickstarter since it's already over, right? Uh, well, we haven't made a decision yet. We've only been in discussions, but uh, we've been talking about um, uh, digital content If when we launch a bigger studio website, because this is going to be all under one single studio name. And we want to launch several dark tales and several graphic novels under the studio name. And we'll okay. probably go forward with more like content and t-shirts and prints and things like that. Um, and we'll have probably old, old issues. But for now, we're just focusing on getting everything done and shipped and printed. Printed and shipped. OK, I'm just going through the Kickstarter. And um, I've not that, that this, this strategy goal for 30,000 was uh, that backers would get an original score. Are you creating it um, for the project right now, or, or it will happen only if the, the pledges would get over 30,000. Uh, sorry, can you repeat that again? Um, I'm just talking about the, the original score that for the Dark Tales. Um, yes. Is it, like, is it going to happen um, with 20,000 on your account or 25,000? Probably, probably not. It depends kind of not. Okay. If, if, if we are ahead of schedule. And we finish up earlier than expected, then maybe we can look into it. Uh, okay. Not quite sure yet, but we'll we'll have to see how things go. Awesome. Okay, it would be awesome to really like it. Would, I think it would be an awesome extension to to such a visually appealing story. We like, we had an idea. We like we had an idea. I think this is the one of the uh, end stretch goals is that we make the comic. As a digital experience, so let's say you're reading comic on the panel, and you're hearing background noise, you're hearing some sort of music, something that sets the mood. You see some kind of uh, subtle digital animation graphics going on to kind of uh, bring you into the scene and experience it more than just a still frame. Yeah. Perhaps even do like voiceovers. Yeah, that reminds me. So someone, sent, someone sent me something when I did Genesis. Uh, when I released it, I think when was it like a month and a half ago? Someone sent me a link to like an online comic book, and it was it was really cool to read a comic like this. And basically, it's what you were describing, yeah. where um, you had you had the images from the comic, but you had small movements in every frame. Like you know, mm -hmm. some particles or clouds moving or something, and you could sort of click through through it at your own pace. But every frame was slightly animated, slightly moving with background noises and yeah. music. It's really cool that um, you know, we can bring it to a next level with what the, the possibilities, technical possibilities that we have these days. Uh, Dave Raposo, who's also one of our backers, he is doing his uh, Star Veil vale comic, which is really cool. It's like an <laughs> online web comic book. But it has elements of uh, moving graphics in it. Mm -hmm. um, but that's one of the ideas. But first, we we just really want to make a book. Uh, yeah. Then we move on from that point and see what we can do. And also the art book that we had as a stretch goal, we really want to push for that. So we we will try to kind of build an audience for it and get interest and inspiration going for the content, so people will feel. Uh, inspired to do some bits of work, inspired by these stories, um, and hopefully, if we do run another campaign, then we'll get a, a we can fund it, we can print it, and ship it. But by then, we should have established like the universe of these stories. Mm -hmm. Okay, now a very important question that we ask every week to our guests. Uh, this is very personal, so you don't have to answer it if you don't feel like. But if you had to choose, would you rather be Godzilla or a millionaire? <laughs> uh, I'd be probably a millionaire because Godzilla 
once you're tired of destroying, what else do you do? Make babies. But when I'm married. <laughs> well, there's that. <laughs> Isn't that what we all do when we're tired of destroying? We just make oh. babies. <laughs> That's like sum up of the whole humanity, you know, it's just, just this. Shit. Yeah, uh, speaking of Godzilla, uh, so MPC did a lot of work on the new Godzilla movie. I got to see some, some exclusive stuff at the screening last Friday, and it looks awesome, guys. It's coming out next month, new Godzilla movie. Go watch it. It's going to be cool. Cool. You're teasing. It's been a while since I've been on cinemas. Yeah, I'm sponsoring Hollywood. Not a good idea. Not a good idea. <laughs> no, but it looks cool. Um, yeah, I, I, I love I love the lore of Godzilla because you know I love Japanese culture and Japanese uh, mythology and stuff, and it's a lot closer to it than the Godzilla that came out in the late nineties, <laughs> which I used to lo I loved when I saw it first, but now I watched it again recently. It's so bad. <laughs> it's a really poor movie. I guess all Ro Roland Emmerich's movies are pretty poor. <laughs> yeah, I loved how they maintained... I, I, I'm talking about the trailer, about Godzilla, and how they maintained not to show Godzilla for, like... Half a year. the whole trial. Yeah, yeah, it was like... They only showed, like, parts of it, or the reactions of, like, citizens and, like, people. Crazy, like how how they're building up the tension between mm -hmm. the creature, like the the villain and the, the you know, it looks really cool. Uh, Levy, quick question. Someone's asking, yeah. um, if you know when the the backers will get the book, and if it would be before the industry workshop in case they want to get it signed by you. Uh, mm. I don't. We're, we're aiming for Christmas right now. Okay. Um, I can't yeah. give any any inside dates yet. Yeah, I think people <laughs> maybe underestimate the amount of work that goes into a comic book. <laughs> it's a lot well, of work. Yeah, and you consider like we're doing this new really pop, uh, rendered style also. Yeah. Uh, and, and it's not just about the rendering, but it has to. Uh, the narrative has to be there, and that is. Quite challenging, actually, because you're dealing with how people read facial expressions and emotions and you know, postures, and what does that suggest in terms of the whole frame context, context mm -hmm. you know, story way. So it's not just drawing superhero characters in a dynamic scene. It's it's like more in a subtle, uh, subtle way. But people, will, if if we're successful, they kind of get get and understand it. Is there any books that you can recommend when it comes to visual storytelling? Uh, we have a couple that have been recommended, like uh, the visual story, creating visual structure film. That's it, one. Um, and Framed Ink is also a really nice one that we've suggested. Mm -hmm. Is there any? Do you have any? Do you have well, any books? I, I was about to suggest uh, Framed Framed Ink, but you also mentioned it too. Um, yeah. Another one which I also find. Interesting is um, this book that I've been reading called Panel Discussions, which interviews a, a lot of different comic book artists, and they're basically breaking down the panels and not like quite making. They are making sense of it, but they really tell, show you how important narrative and storytelling is, even with you know simple rendered comics. Can you say that again? Uh, panel discussions. I can forward a link. Okay. Oh, I'll find it. It's okay. I just well, I will add it to. Uh, so is it uh, design and sequential art storytelling, right? Yeah. yeah. Yes. 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 Oh, cool. uh, yeah. Okay. So you have uh, artists like worked on DC and Marvel, uh, Hellboy and. So on and so on. They kind of some are editors, some are the artists, some are the writers, but they all give their input on the workflow and kind of kind of design the pages and the channels and so on and so on. It's really interesting if you yeah. want to understand more about comics. Yeah. 
And I mean, like, a lot of this is very applicable to concept art as well. Like, for example, my own work is not very narrative most of the time because I've I've started from sort of a mood environment setting. Like, I never used to draw characters in my scenes. I just wanted to draw pretty scenes. But I'm getting more into story storytelling. And it's really interesting how this information is transposable to, you know, other types of illustration and concept art and stuff because there's just so many subtle cues with where you put characters and where you put certain things that tell you more oh, yeah. about yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, if you, uh, let's see, there is, uh, let me find your, that, that I mentioned the panel breakdown. So uh, can you see my screen now? Yep. So we did a panel breakdown of this image here, kind of discussing why the people are placed where they are, uh, why they're looking in certain and different directions, and what is kind of like the emotional impact you get from watching the scene and understanding what's going on here. There's a lot of subtle things, but you, you, uh, we explained it in, in, in the video. Yeah, cool, man. It's something that you see in television a lot as well. Definitely, even like you know, soap series and stuff. It's it's there's so many subtle things that you can tell with body language and you know directions, yeah. people facing each other, facing away from each other. Exactly. So this this video shows you from the sketch uh, sketch uh, stage up to like experimentation and color tests and uh, body postures and so on and so on. And hopefully that those decisions will make make sense for the viewer as they read it. Mm -hmm. So this is kind of like the level of uh, detail when we, we want to push for every panel we do. Some are more or less complex, but yeah. So I'm just going to add um, it to the website right now. So if you guys check in a minute or two, the link's going to be in the on the website as well. Is there any other books that you can uh, yeah. recommend? Like anything that you've that you've really learned a lot from that you want to share with the viewers? Um, dum, dum. You, in terms of comics or something else? Or? No, just anything because we share books. Any art-related books, you know, it can be anatomy, it can be about color theory, it can be anything. Um, anything that you think is beneficial. It can be about fashion or architecture or design. Um, there's, let's see, well. Well, usually when I get these books, it's more in terms of inspiration rather than uh, a breakdown of the artworks or process. Uh, yeah, it's fine. fine. One of my favorite favorite artists is Eduard Thiago. Uh, I have, have a couple books with his works. It's just amazing uh, works of art. He really mastered uh, watercolors. And you can look look at these works and just be blown away about how simple they are, but how accurate they are at the same time. For instance, like this. Another one is another favorite is Richard Schmidt. Uh, his character portraits, his uh, uh, landscape uh, paintings. There's a couple. There's a couple books you can get from directly from his website. Um, have one of those. Other than this that, I really, really love like photography books. Mm. Yeah, his his the, his power in thumbnailing is just amazing. This shows you how how powerful thumbnailing can be. Because from what I'm seeing, yeah. I'm seeing only thumbnails now on your screen. Mm -hmm. And they look so photographic and, and you know accurate and beautiful. And I'm sure when I zoom into them, they'll be very rough and very simple. But if you wanna, if you think about it, if you wanna describe a scene, it doesn't really need detail. You need mm -hmm. detail if you really wanna be very specific about some something. Mm -hmm. If you wanna draw the eye focus somewhere, then you maybe you emphasize the detail there. Or if you specifically want to want to say that this design is important, then then you do it. But overall, like just storytelling wise, uh, like a simple scene like this, you don't really have to render. Yeah. And what that's I like why I kind of, mm -hmm. Sorry, go ahead. 
that's why I kind of prefer doing this thumbnail technique because then you can kind of you can suggest a story and narrative, and if you really like the image, then push for more details in terms of design. Yeah, what I what I sometimes like with doing details is adding, but this is a personal thing, is just adding little little things for the viewers to find when they look around for longer. Um, kind of like a like an Easter egg hunt or something, because you can add like a lot of fun fun little cues that are only seenable in seeable in the details. But obviously, you know, you they cannot draw away from the overall composition and focal point. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. But yeah. Well, I, one of my main reasons why I got into map painting because I really love the, the, the type of high polished detail work. Like, I always really enjoy watching map painting breakdowns when there's mm -hmm. like the VS Awards or the Oscars, and with the the shots that are really really well done, you're completely blown away because it's it's so real. It, it feels so. Uh, and I, I just love the the fact that you're just being cheated. So that's one of my first reasons that I got into map painting and how can you uh, practice this kind of invisible art, which is what it's also called. And how can you reach that level of, of realism? Uh, it's actually not as simple as copy-pasting elements because you, when you're working with map painting, you were working on a much, much more subtle way uh, and, and more narrow or um, uh, frames when you're, you're Try to achieve really good realism. Sometimes, like a shift of two five percent, can determine if something works or not. Mm -hmm. It's like uh, even looking at how images are uh, compressed or uh, kind of artifacted. You can sometimes tell that certain elements have high quality than others. Yeah. Um, so they're. Yeah. So I'll, yeah. I, I noticed actually, like it's. The good thing about seeing stuff on TVs or cinema screens is it tends to hide those kind of those kind of mistakes. Sometimes I've I've seen matte paintings on the internet that I know from movies, and I look at them mm -hmm. on the internet. I'm like, wow, they're actually there's some really dodgy stuff in there that doesn't look that good. But for some reason, yeah. in a moving image and through the blurring of the TV or the, the cinema screen, it kind of you, you get you can get away with a little bit of you know sharpness difference or noise difference and things like that. Yeah, like each each shot you're working on, you can really analyze like what is necessary to make this this shot work. Mm -hmm. If the, if you know the shot is really really fast, it's like 30 frames or something, and it's moving camera, then you don't really need the detail. But if it's a long long shot and the camera moves in and you see closer up, then of course it's gonna require a lot more work and work in the camera target area. <clears throat> So each shot is kind of like, okay, where do I need to focus most of my work here? Mm -hmm. Sometimes, like certain certain DMPs have kind of like a similar approach to most shots uh, to kind of expect that they need to keep <coughs> full control over everything. Uh, control is good, but you need to know within with what kind of uh, frames you need that control. Like some certain certain work I've seen is that it's unnecessarily too much control. Like you're keeping layers that if you turn them on and off and you barely even notice it, then it becomes like. <laughs> almost That's because you're a flattener just like me. <laughs> What's that? I was. You're a flattener, just like me. <laughs> I was talking to um to Leanne like a month ago or something, and she's like, "Levy's a flattener. God damn it! I have to work with his PSDs, and they're all flat." <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, I kind of. Yeah, yeah. I'm a, I'm a, I'm, I'm a merger. <laughs> <laughs> That's like another race, a merger, and merging things, merging layers. <laughs> uh, I totally understand though, like I also hate layers and I've regretted it some certain things, but usually 
I find that merging some things in the end is going to save me more time than, than browsing through hundreds. Some people just keep layers for the most, you know, pointless things where you, like, you know, it's just yeah. useless and it's Everything really slowing down. Yeah. <laughs> you might as well put every brush stroke on a layer. Why not? Yeah. Gives you perfect control, doesn't it? <laughs> well, you, have to be a, you have to be a good judge of what exactly is needed to keep separate. Yeah, um, yeah. Yeah. Uh, it, it should be reasonable. Yeah. But usually it's like it's a it's usually an edge an edge issue. I mean, in my experience, edges are the most important reason to keep things on separate layers. Um, apart from that, maybe some things that are with certain blending modes, but apart from that, not so much. Yeah. Cool. Any more questions? Anything? Uh, well, actually, since we're talking about matte painting, people, someone was asking about <clears throat> what went into the matte paintings that you did for uh, StarCraft. Uh, what went in? Yeah, I guess maybe uh, the person wants to hear, like, what kind of technical things you needed to use. I, I assume you had to use a lot of 3D and stuff in, uh, uh, in your StarCraft. Yeah. Right. So as I mentioned before, each shot needs you kind of need to analyze what is going on there. Is there interaction? Is there, uh, uh, you know, if you're doing, for instance, the sunrise shot I did for Diablo, which is was very time-consuming shots because there's uh, so many things that are going on on there in terms of lighting changing and uh, and movement. And so, when you're when you're working with DMP, you're working with uh, uh, static images. So how can you make something that is not static and it's changing and it's kind of moving? Mm -hmm. uh, so each shot was a little it, it was different from each other. Uh, you do have all though the kind of standard shots with sky replacement things like that, where it doesn't really impact what what happens in the foreground with the foreground characters. Um, then there are also highly interactive shots where you have the character somehow interact with the map painting. Like I remember we did this shot for Cataclysm, and we have this dragon, and he uh, Deathwing, I think his name was. Yeah, Deathwing flies over uh, some mountains, and he bursts uh, fire towards the camera, and the whole fire, of course, it's it's lighting things up, but it's lighting up the map painting. And you have to realize that the the source of lighting is moving. It's not like a static turn on the light switch kind of thing. Mm -hmm. So you uh, imagine that the shadows are also kind of changing and the lights are moving. Uh, so that was very highly interactive. So we had to design an environment uh, and design a map painting so we could ch paint different types of lighting situations. So between the lighting situations, we would animate. And kind of blend it seamlessly, and to make and combine it with 3D renders. So certain shots are more more complex than others when it comes to highly interactive stuff like lighting or FX interaction. Uh, like we did a lot some more cataclysm stuff where we did the uh, the ground which some of the creatures walk on, and a lot of that was projected. But then there you have like blowing dust and wind kind of interacting with geometry and kind of wraps around and moves around the objects. Um, so you have to make those elements work together. Uh, and other other shots we did were more like and more challenging in terms of how you handle that much data. When we did the uh, StarCraft, uh, Heart of the Swarm City. Yeah, <clears throat> impressive, man. When I first saw it, I was just like, holy crap. <laughs> yeah, all that city is, is uh, done by uh, a group of three, four guys. Wow, really? Wow. Uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's nice. So, that, but that was kind of it. Like, when we got the script, we got the color keys, and so, like, all right, guys, here it is. Uh, now, Create a city, right? <laughs> make it so real. Have, yeah, make it real. So <laughs> this is where you go into kind of analyzing the problem and see how the camera moves. And often the case is that the camera was not locked down. You weren't mm -hmm. sure of exactly where it's going, where it's going to see things. 
Yeah. So this is another thing you have to be kind of prepared for, that you're covering more just in case in terms of camera changing. So do you find that, you know, as soon as someone says the camera's not locked down, you take, like, some paracetamol preemptively straight away? Because it's just going to be well, a mess. Well, I try to... <laughs> I try to narrow narrow it down to know more exactly what they want to do. Like for instance, yeah. I say they they are happy with the overall camera move, but they might introduce like jiggle or something like that. Mm-hmm. So it will it will it will not be like a completely one eighty degree turnaround and show something else. It's not going to yeah. be that extreme. But at least you know that within let's say hundred or fifty pixels, you will have the camera moving. I say, okay, that's fine. Then, then you can uh, add additional coverage to make sure that when the camera does does change, you're already covered. Mm-hmm. All right. But it's not really it's not really guaranteed. Like every, you know, it's up to the director to decide what they want to do. Uh, they can make decisions like, oh, let's turn the camera around. There's nothing you can do about it, really. No, not really. Well, I mean, I guess sometimes it depends if 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 you've got a fixed budget, if you've got like you know, if you've agreed on a budget, and they're suddenly making new changes that are going to influence the amount of work, I guess you can sort of push for certain things. It depends. Oh, yeah. I mean, I've had it a couple of times that directors are like, "Oh, let's do this," and you know, you have to say like, "Sorry, but you know, that's going to be that much extra money." <laughs> yeah. Well, you 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 try to voice it as, as make an argument for it. Yeah, yeah. Okay, we can we can do it, but it's gonna take this much time. Yeah. It's not impossible, but yeah. The importance of diplomacy. Yes, yes, yes. Anything else or Yeah, I um, we're about to round up. To, yeah. yeah. We're um, over two hours right now. Chris and Jeffrey Harrow are in the chat, and they're asking a very important question to you, Levy. Okay. What is your favorite beverage? <laughs> it's definitely not cider. <laughs> you, you, really? Is, strong, bro. Come on, man. Chris, oh, come on. Chris is a big cider fan, and now everyone knows who's watching this. So go hassle him. <laughs> well, they're in the chat, so they already knew. People uh, yeah. Yeah. So, what is your favorite be- beverage then? Because you didn't answer the question. Uh, well, I've been drinking more wine lately, but uh, whiskey, Japanese whiskey, I really like. Whiskey. Japanese whiskey, really. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Hmm. The Suntory brands. Mm-hmm. Hibiki, Yamazaki, really good, really smooth whiskey. Okay, so we will add that to the vodka section of uh, the website. <laughs> whiskey <laughs> section. Japanese whiskey. <laughs> you can find all our alcohol uh, recommendations yeah. there. It's a lot of uh, like food recipes. <laughs> <laughs> We're expanding level up into you know. Yeah. The culinary the world. master chef and kitchen <laughs> academy, right? <laughs> uh, I think people. I think so. We maybe need to clear up to everyone that we are actually not alcoholics. We make a lot of yeah. alcohol jokes, but none of us actually drink a lot. <laughs> it just. Yeah. I don't know how this even started. Somehow. It Only just... clean water. He is right about it. So. Oh, actually, I remember how it started. There was an empty bottle of vodka in the screen behind someone, like yeah, and and said, "We go behind you." Behind you, Wojtek. Oh, yeah, behind me. And, and behind, next uh, session yours. was like behind every of us. <laughs> 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 you inspired us, man. <laughs> yeah. All right, I just want to do a quick shout out that there's still eight remaining tickets for the workshop for people who want to attend and want to listen, uh, like, more about concept art mapping, uh, 2D traditional art. Um, so go go get them. Cool, man. So 42 have sold in the last hour or what? Uh, 42 sold, yeah. Nice. Okay. So they will be gone will, before the end of this day. <laughs> <Yeah. clears throat> 
All right, so we're going to round up. Uh, thank you, Levy, for taking the time to join us today. Um, thank you so much. Really cool yeah, to see your thumbnail approach. I hope that people can learn from it and can see the importance of it. Um, there was a guy, Arno, that we had a couple of weeks ago who had a very similar approach. He was really focusing on working very zoomed out. A lot of people have a problem grasping it, but I suggest to everyone to really give it a go because it's so powerful. And, you know, the importance of your brushstrokes or the... the, the Things that your brushstrokes change on that level are much more important than what you do in a zoomed, zoomed in um, I, I way of working. Yeah, right. it, 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 people have been some been trying it, and they've been like very positive about the results. Say it really helps them and makes them feel comfortable about the mm -hmm. color combination and lighting, and uh, because it could be like a very intimidating <laughs> thing, like how do you light something very, very realistically or work in a very relaxed way, you know, or uh, set down your composition and make it work. So, uh, yeah, yeah. I hope people find it useful. Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely, man. Yeah, uh, you, you are a true inspiration to me as well. I, I knew your work since I had started digital painting, so it always, like, I was always inspired for you. your stuff. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> It's very, very, very kind of you, Wojtek. Thanks. <laughs> yeah, and uh, you know, I just ch checked out your live stream channel, and all the sessions are gone from there. Like, I think the new live stream was deleting the older sessions, or maybe if you can find the sketching sessions, if you can find the link to it, I would love to share it with uh, more people because I. I found them really, really awesome and beneficial. So, if you I, I have do, them anywhere, yeah, I do have the, uh, the the recorded live streams, and I've been thinking about um, uploading into the YouTube channel. Um, collect it there. Maybe we can share that it that way. That awesome because they're yeah. yeah yeah cool. All right, yeah, All man. Right. Thanks so much. You're welcome. So we will announce so the next yes. Yeah. Sorry. No, go ahead. Uh, yeah. So I just wanted to um, to say goodbye and <laughs> if, you, if you're enjoying the session, please subscribe and uh, yeah, we will get an info about the next session and uh, today, right, Jonas? Um, well, maybe I'm talking to the to the next artist, but we have good news. It's a girl. Yeah. Yay. Finally. Yay. Wait, where is it? Where is it? Uh, <laughs> where is it? Where is it? <laughs> uh, so yeah, we will. One important thing about next week. So if we get the guest confirmed, I'm just talking to her now. We're gonna have a different time because she's in Singapore. So for. Europe, it's probably going to be around 11 p.m., so quite late. Uh, for the people in America, it'll be around noon, so that probably won't be too much of an issue. And for people in Asia, it's going to be really early, like 7 to 8 a.m. in the morning. But, you know, the world is round. What can we do about it? Uh, so, yeah, stay tuned. Cool. Yeah. So, thank you. Thank you, Levy, again. And uh, see you guys next time. Bye. Bye. Bye.